Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Rich Cosner here at Coldwell Banker Southern Realty. In our topic this morning, we're going to be talking about how to know if you have a buyer or not. And one of the frustrating things, and neither of you are brand new agents, but especially the newest agents, they wind up working with these buyers or spending time with people they think are buyers and then at the end of the day the people never buy and yet they've spent time with them given them their <laughs> their blood sweat and tears and so forth and my objective today is to be able to share with you and the viewers about how do you know the difference how do you know the difference between who's a buyer and who isn't and so to start I, I need I want uh, the two of us the three of us to understand this sentence and it's simply this buyers who buy buy buyers who don't buy don't buy However, buyers that buy take every relevant step along the way. And that is how you know the difference between a buyer and a non-buyer. Because the buyers, the real buyer, will take all the relevant steps along the way. And we'll get to those relevant steps in a minute. But this is really, if you could just Im embed that in your brain. Buyers that buy, buy. Buyers that don't buy, don't buy. But the buyers that buy, take every relevant step along the way. And that's how you know the difference. So when we talk about what the, what the relevant steps are, and by the way, uh, there's no, we all operate under the premise there's no bad people. So if you have a buyer that's not going to buy, it doesn't mean they're bad people. They're just not buying today, or maybe maybe they never will, but they're just, they're just not a buyer. And so what my job is, is to help my, my team understand the difference. Okay, so what do you do with the buyers that aren't going to buy? What do you do with the ones that really are buying, obviously? So, uh, so as we go through these steps, uh, those of you hopefully uh, on video will have a foundations book. And uh, this is one of our foundations pages. I show it here as page 17. I'm not sure if that's the page number in your newest book. But so here are the relevant steps, though. The first thing they need to do is to make an appointment with you. Now, this appointment, it could be a Zoom appointment, but it's probably best if it's a face-to-face -face appointment. And, and let me back up one second. Chances are, if these people called you, they might have called you about a particular house that maybe you po did a post on or something, and they've got a question about it or they might want to see it. I would encourage you that we give all of these people a, a free look, if you will. Here's what I mean by that. It's okay to go show them. Okay, go show them the house they talked about, even if you haven't got them with a lender yet and that sort of thing. Because if, if what happens is somebody calls you up, and let's just say, Lori, somebody calls you or you call me maybe about for info on a house, and the first thing I say is, well, you've got to get pre-qualified. You've got to get this. You've got to get that. And next thing you know, you've got some lender, some voice on the phone you've never heard from or heard of. They're asking you for Social Security, employment, and all the, and we don't have a relationship yet. So we haven't really earned that right to be doing that. So that's where I would, it's okay to show them, uh, you know, maybe that one house that they called about. Now, I digress, especially for the ladies, but it's uh, true for the men as well. There's a safety issue here. You want to make sure the first time you're meeting somebody that, uh, that you're in a, it's a safe situation. And what I mean by that is you might meet them at the office first before you, before you show them. You, you're going to want to make sure that you've got, assuming it's a husband and wife, that, uh, you know, that they're both going to be there, that they're both looking at home with you. If it happens to be just a guy by himself, 
then I would encourage you to have somebody go with you. Now, that may not be the case second, third, fourth appointment or whatever, because you know them and you know, you know you're good, but it's just a security uh, issue that you want to be cognizant of. So, but, so I would make that appointment and many times you can sh have that showing and especially if they're meeting you at the office, you can go look at the house and come back and have a meeting here at the office. And that meeting is just to find out uh, a little bit about them. And this gives you the opportunity to build that relationship. That's really what we're trying to accomplish here. And it's simply, you know, think of it this way, the who, what, when, where, why, and how kinds of questions, okay? You find out who they are. Who is the buyer? Is it a husband and wife? Is it a father, son? Is it uh, a veteran? It, whatever. You, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna find out, so who that buyer is, uh, what it is they're looking for, that's the who, what, when, where, why, how, what is it they're looking for? And, uh, you know, and just sit back and listen. And they're going to, they're probably going to describe a bigger or nicer property than they can afford. That's just, we all want one or two steps up from what we can probably afford. But you just, at this point, we're just there to listen and figure out what it is. And then if, if there's anything in particular they say that triggers, you, don't be afraid to ask why. If somebody says, well, they have to have a bedroom on the first floor. Say, okay, we can probably find one of those. Why is that important? Because it's not what they say, it's why they say it. If you understand the whys, you're going to be way down the road as opposed to just, you know, well, they want a three bedroom, two bath, uh, you know, which there's hundreds of them in the MLS. So you wanna, they, they wanna find a special property and you need to know what special means to them. So, so, Again, so this appointment ideally is maybe after you've shown that home, you've come back to the office and you're having this conversation. And that's after you've, you've got this info, okay, so a couple of the who, what, when, where, why, how, why are they buying, why are they buying now? I mean, so, you know, this can, conversation can take 15, 20 minutes or, or longer, just let it, let it flow. And, uh, then you have a real good idea what it is they're looking for and why, and why it's important. This is where you introduce uh, the fact that you, they want to get pre, you want them to get pre-approved for a loan. Now, there's two kinds of, there's two terms that you're gonna hear a lot. You're gonna hear uh, pre-qualified and you're gonna hear pre-approved. Here's the difference. Pre-qualified isn't worth having a discussion over. Pre-qualified is a lender says to you, okay, I've talked to these people, they sound pretty good, and uh, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Pre-approved, the lender has run their credit, probably verified their employment, and uh, has a pretty good indication uh, of uh, of what they're going to be able to afford. And so that's where, that's where this pre-approval is really important. Now it's obviously important for the buyer so that we don't sell them something they can't afford, but more important, it's you're positioning this so that you can write a great offer when you find the right house. If they are pre-approved, it's going to make your job a lot easier. When you present that offer to a listing agent, you're gonna to wanna to su uh, submit that pre-approval letter and probably proof of funds. Uh, even if it's a low down payment, you wanna submit a proof of funds to show that they've got the money for whatever, however they're gonna finance it. And, uh, and you wanna submit that lender letter. So where this is important to your buyer is, let's say it's a, let's just make up a number, it's a $200,000 home. Well, there's a lot of people that wanna buy a $200,000 home and there's not that many of them. So chances are you're going to be in a multiple offer situation in a home in that price range. If they are pre-approved 
and you have proof of funds, wrote a, the right offer and so forth, your odds of getting that uh, accepted are far higher than an agent that comes in with, uh, without a pre-approval, without proof of funds. It just, it's going to make your job a lot easier. But the, the reason for the home, or I'm sorry, the buyer to get pre-approved is so he has a better chance of getting his offer accepted. Without it, it's very, very challenging. And I, I'll turn the tables and say to each of you, if you're a listing agent and somebody's bringing you an offer, your job is to uh, check that offer out and can these people really buy the house? You don't want to take your listing off the market for somebody that can't buy it. So the pre-approval is very, very important. So now the seller, the homeowner, may not get the significance of this, but their listing agent will. And the listing agent will be explaining it to them and what, what the difference is. So, uh, a couple points here back on our, our notes. So, they keep, oh, and here's the next thing. So, they make an appointment with you, but they show up. Uh, you're both uh, experienced enough in the business know people make appointments and then they're no-shows, okay? And what's worse is they're no-show, no-call. And so it's very, while it is rude, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe something happened once, <laughs> okay? We had, uh, there's a gal in our, uh, our Columbia office, and the people's reason for not showing up, it was raining and their windshield wipers didn't work. <laughs> on their car, so, but they did show up for the next appointment, so it, so it, maybe it was legit, but the point I want to make is, you give them, okay, so you're going to call them, and okay, what happened, they're going to have their story, and so you make another appointment. If they don't show for that appointment, you're done. And done means we're not going to be rude to them or anything else, they're just not a buyer, okay? They remember the relevant steps. Well, the relevant step is to make an appointment. The next one's to show up. Mm -hmm. If you can't get them to show up, they're they're just they're not bad people. They're just not a buyer. Okay. So if they don't Please. show up the second time, right? Yes. But then they but then they continue to text, to like message you or, or or reach out. How would you recommend addressing that? Uh, it's a gut call, meaning. I mean, how many times are they not going to show up? Mm -hmm. Now, if they're reaching out to me, apologizing and this and that, I'm going to hear that, and I'm going to—I'm probably going to work, continue to work with them. But uh, if it's a no-show again, or they're not cooperative, then it's just you can't help them. Mm -hmm. You can't help people that won't help themselves. We have systems, and this is a system to help people get into a home. And if they're not going to, if they're not going to take the steps, now they don't have this. They don't know what the steps are. So we, we're going to counsel them through that in our appointment if we can get to one. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I would just say trust your, trust your gut. Okay. And if they're, if they're begging to meet you with, you let them. <laughs> uh, so in that appointment here, in the notes I make here, they're going to be open with you. They're going to give you the details about what they want and why it's important to them. Okay? Then they're going to let you counsel them. And they're going to listen to the facts of life, as I call it, the facts of life about the real estate market and the price range they're looking in. Now. They haven't met with a lender yet, probably, but let's say they're looking, they're, maybe they're telling you they want to buy a house in, uh, in, we're doing this program today in Lawrenceburg, and there are houses under $200,000 in Lawrenceburg, but they're not, uh, the facts of life are, those houses may have pretty extensive repairs, they, you know, there may be issues, there, they may be issues with them, but because they're, there are so few of them in that price range, they are going to be in a multiple offer situation. So the fact of life is that you want to tell these people they're most likely going to need to make a, uh, a full price offer on a home in that price range. Now, let's contrast that if they were in a 
looking at a four hundred or a five hundred thousand dollar home in, uh, let's say, our Lawrence County market, they might it might be reasonable for them to make an offer under under the list price because there's quite a few of those homes on the market. It's not as competitive, so that would be realistic. So when I'm talking in my, my notes here about the facts of life, if somebody's under $200,000, it's probably going to be a multiple offer, and you, you want to counsel them now that it's probably, they're probably going to have to make a full price offer. Now, we all are going to meet buyers, every buyer, it doesn't matter what price range, they want a deal, okay? Now you have people out there that think they're going to, and I'm making up numbers, but let's say it's a $200,000 house and they're, they want to write a $160,000 offer. Well, it's just, that's not realistic. It's not going to, it, it's just not going to work. If it would sell for 160, the listing agent already would have bought it. <laughs> so you, so, but having that conversation now is important. Here's why. So if you don't have the conversation about why it's important to write a, uh, a full price offer, then you go out, you show homes, they fall in love with them, uh, fall in love with one of them, and that's when they tell you, well, we'll, we'll pay 160 for this $200,000 listed home. At that point, you start having the conversation, and now you're just being a salesman, salesperson, saleswoman, trying to get them to increase their price. If you have the conversation before they've found the house they love, then they, then it's not emotional. It's not, they're not thinking you're just trying to get them to raise the price. You're giving them the facts of life about today's real estate market. So, in these discussions, uh, Chances are on a $180,000 house, they may, may need some financing help. Maybe they are, uh, maybe it's a, a veteran buyer and he's buying with no, no money down, which is fine, but they may need help with closing costs and some things like that. So that may, so if they're asking for anything like that, or if they think they're going to, that full price offer becomes very, very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, all right, so then the next point here, and so when you've counseled them, give them some of these facts of life, now they agree to meet with your lender and become fully approved with your lender. Now, this is even if they tell you they've already been approved by a lender. In the real estate business, many, uh, you know, the internet is what the, they call it the World Wide Web, and there's a reason. A lot of our clients have gotten pre approved with a lender, an internet lender. The problem with an internet lender is, Lori, you can't call that guy or gal, there. It's, it's a big corporation. You can't call somebody and get details about. How are they approved? What kind of loans do they have? You, they just get some piece of paper that they're pre-approved for, for whatever. The reason you want them to get pre-approved with your lender is that your lender has a relationship with you and is going to be, give you the straight scoop. What I mean by that, if there's, if there's a credit problem, your lender, now your lender may not get into the details because there's privacy issues, but they're, they're gonna give you a heads up that, hey, you can't go above uh, 240 because of debt to income ratios, or, or they're, they're gonna tell you different things where you're never gonna get that from an internet lender. They, first off, there's nobody to call, so you can't, <coughs> you're relying on this piece of paper. Now, there's nothing wrong if they can close with that internet lender. We're not saying they can't get their loan from him. We just want to be pre-approved with your lender. Maybe the internet lender has a quarter or a half a percent better interest rate. Fine, close with that guy or that internet lender if they can close, but you want your lender to scope it out first to know that they that they're a real buyer. That's in your your lender has a relationship with you where 
they're hoping, obviously, that they're going to get a lot of loans from you. And so they're going to return your call quickly. They're going to give you, they're going to help you with that buyer any way they possibly can. Where the internet lender, you know, like I'm repeating myself, but you'll never talk to them. There's nobody, nobody to talk to. And I'm thinking like, what's the big internet lender, uh, Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage, uh, some of these these companies, and uh, you know they do close a lot of loans. They but they're just a nightmare to work with for the real estate professionals. So now some people are afraid that <coughs> oh they're going to run my credit again. It's going to knock my credit down a few more points. What I believe to be true, and I would hey hi can I borrow your phone? We're trying to get into a Google account. I'll bring it back to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you need uh, a code? To, Open it. <laughs> Face open it and we'll have to keep it open until we get in there. Sorry to interrupt you guys. You can just cut this part out. Yeah, I'll just edit it out. <laughs> I think you're good. Thank you so much. Uh, so the credit. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So here's, so what I believe is true, but I, I want to verify this. If, let's say uh, Adeline Perkins runs your credit report from uh, Fairway Mortgage. And you also want they they want another lender to do it. That's fine. If if it's within a thirty day period and it's mortgage credits, I think it only counts once. Okay. Now I want to verify that, but uh, I was told that recently by a lender. But I, I I just want to double check it. But I believe that to be the case. So, but if it gets outside that thirty day window, then it's another hit. It's another hard. Uh, it's a hard, uh, hard inquiry, they call it, on your, on your credit report. Okay. Okay? So, on your, uh, so, the next step, now remember, we're talking about all the relevant steps here. The next relevant step, after they've introduced you to a lender, or you've introduced them to a lender, they gotta cooperate with that lender. Mm -hmm. That means giving a, that lender the information, employment information, their, uh, they'll pick up the credit card information most likely off the credit report, but there'll be questions that the lender has that they need to answer uh, and so forth. And so cooperating with that lender is critical. At any of these steps, if they don't cooperate or they don't take the next step, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. They're probably just not a buyer, okay? and. It's, it's hard if you think back, and both of you have been at this a year or so, but if you think back when you were a brand new agent, you thought everybody was a buyer and you wanted to, you know, you were doing, you'd do anything to help these people, but you'll learn if people won't help themselves, you can't, you, you can't help, you can't help people that don't want to be helped. So, so, the point of the relevant steps again is if they, once they stop taking the relevant steps, they're probably not a buyer. Not a bad person, just not a buyer. Now, they, so as we say here, they cooperate with the lender. Uh, after that, now once your lender has given you, uh, here's, these people are good to go. They can afford $260,000, they've got 20% down and yada, yada, yada. Now you're good to go. Now you can go show them the homes that they, they can afford. And uh, you want to be able, uh, and this will be important as one of your steps, as you're showing them these homes, you want them to give you honest feedback. Do they like it? Do they hate it? Uh, somewhere in between, what do they like? What don't they like? Uh, strategically, you always want them comparing just two homes. And here's what I mean. <coughs> I'll tell you how to do that in a second. <coughs> but otherwise, you'll get to the end of five showing. You know, let's say you showed five homes that day. Well, they want the swimming pool from house number one. They want the kitchen from number two. They want the backyard of number three. And do you know what I mean? So what you can't, that'll drive you mad. So what you want to do, you show them house number one, and they either like it or they don't, then you show them house number two, okay? Of which one do they like better? One or two, okay? So they like number two better. Okay, great. So now we're gonna show them house number three. 
do you like house number two or house number three better? Mm -hmm. So you're always comparing against one house, not four or five. Okay, I, I had my eyes exam recently and this reminds me of, you know, how they switch the thing and is it number one or number two? Number, you know, and that's kind of what we're doing with, the, uh, with our buyers so that, to keep them focused on which, on a house, on a house. And, and you're good with whichever one they choose, but you just want to keep them focused on uh, a choice, not multiple choices. So, uh, so there, oh, that's my point there. It's a yes or no about, uh, about each home. Now, they make a decision to buy. So now, this is the next relevant step. They're going to write an offer with you. And so hopefully that offer is going to be one that you're going to uh, be proud to, to represent them, uh, that you're going to be able, proud to take to a listing agent. And so you want them to have given you proof of funds. Uh, and that might be just a, a copy of a bank statement. That show, let's say this example, they've got 20% down on a $250,000 home, that's a $50,000 down payment. You just need a bank statement showing $50,000 in the bank. Now, chances are the lender uh, that pre-approved them already has that, but you'll ask them for it too. So you have proof of funds that you present with your offer. Uh, so you're going to present that, your offer, uh, and your uh, pre-approval letter to that listing agent. And uh, so, now, the next thing is you're going to stay in touch through the offer process. Maybe you get an, a, a, an acceptance. Maybe you get a counteroffer. You're probably going to get some kind of counteroffer. Could be on price. Could be on some terms. Uh, maybe it's on timing. Maybe the people can't move out by October 15th. They need till November 15th. And there's some negotiation back and forth between uh, what the timing of the closing is. My counsel to my people always is close as early as possible. Here's what I mean by that. So let's, uh, today uh, happens to be, what is this, the 9th or October 10th maybe? Uh, <laughs> let's say today is uh, October what? 10th. It is the 10th. Okay, it's <laughs> October 10th. Maybe, uh, maybe the buyer, let's say the buyer can close in, in 30 days but the seller doesn't want to move for 60 days. You want to close it in 30 days, okay? And then you do a rent back where the seller rents the property back from that buyer, okay? Reason being, close early because things happen. People lose their jobs. Uh, over the course of my career, We've had people getting in a car accident. We've had deaths, I mean, during, during the uh, escrow process. And so every day an escrow is open is another day something can happen to it. So close early, as po early as you possibly can. And then your transaction's uh, completed. And uh, now, every once in a while, you'll have somebody say, well, what if the seller destroys the property while they're living there? Look, if, they have, if they've lived there for the last 10 years and they haven't destroyed it, they're probably not going to destroy it in the next 30 days. So it's just, that's just, and so there's protections in the uh, rental agreement, the rent back agreement that, that'll address those issues, but rarely in my career over almost 40 years of this, you, you don't see it very often. It, it's not a problem. So, but the counsel again there is to close as soon as you possibly can. Another reason to close, especially in a volatile interest rate market like we're in right now, you people, the chances are they've locked their loan. And they locked their loan means, uh, for example, maybe they've got a 7% loan lock. Well, if they go outside that 30-day loan lock, what if rates have gone to 7.5% or something? And now they have to go through a qualification process all over again. So you want to stay within your loan locks as much as as much as you possibly can so so the next step the last step they close escrow and refer you to all their friends or relatives co-workers and so forth and uh, so this 
you know, you, you think about the, how we started this is, okay, how do, we, how do we know who's a buyer and who isn't? I'll come back. Buyers that buy, buy. Buyers that don't buy, don't buy. But buyers that buy take every relevant step along the way. It's up to you to keep your people on track because, like I said, they don't have this relevant step list or step list. So you, but you do mentally now, and you'll, you know, your nef next few buyers. I would encourage you to keep this with you and just make sure they're taking the relevant steps. And so, uh, if you do that, your life is going to have a lot more control than uh, is if you're just wor working with ten different buyers and you're trying to. Uh, it, it's just a nightmare trying to keep track of all of them. So. Uh, Callista may have heard me say this. I'm not sure if Lori has, but when you're working, let's say, let's say you've got 10 buyers, 10 people that you're looking for homes for. If you try to give each one of those people 10% of your time, you'll sell nobody. There is an old, I believe it's a Chinese proverb that goes something like this. The man who tries to catch two rabbits catches none. Okay, the point is, let's say you do have 10 buyers and 10 people that are looking for a home. You want to be fair to all of them, so you give each one 10%, you're going to sell nobody. So what you want to do is the, you want to figure out of those 10, who's the one that's going to buy next, okay? That person gets half your time. Whatever time you're going to devote to all your buyers, that guy, gal, couple, they get half the time. Then, then you're doing a quality job with them, so you get them under contract. Now you've got nine left, or maybe you've got another couple in the meantime, but now you do it again. Who's going to buy next? That's the person that's going to get your time. Now you're going to find in real life, there's probably a couple people that are going to buy sooner than some other people, but, it's, but if you'll keep that in mind, you're going to want to work with the people that are going to buy next. Otherwise, you're, you're working with people that might not buy for three or four months, and next thing you know, the guy that was ready to buy, he drove by an open house or went into a new home uh, development without you, and you get the call Sunday afternoon, well, Lori, I'm sorry, I bought a new home. And uh, so we're out. So, so just, uh, so keeping, do a great, great job for your buyer by your, this is, this is no manipulation in any of this. What we're doing is helping them get from a, want to have uh, somebody that wants to buy a house to the person that becomes a homeowner. And uh, that is uh, the reason this process exists is to, to give you, I don't want to call it rules, but guide, guide posts or guard rail, guardrails is a better example. If you stay within these guardrails, you're going to help your buyer get to a successful outcome. And that's what we're all trying to achieve. So questions? Sounds great to me. <laughs> okay. On the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the real world is this is not perfect. There's going to be, it was like Callista said, okay, well, what if somebody calls me back after two or three times and they keep wanting to talk to me? Okay. Well, that's, that's a good thing. So, but it's within the guardrails. You know what I mean? Right. You're, if, if you keep things within the guardrails, you're, and we're doing it to help the buyer. Yes, does it help us? Well, sure, it helps us, but uh, we haven't helped them if we don't get them a house. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, this is a very professional way to go about it, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll have a lot of success with it. So, Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions, Callista? Okay, where in like the relevant steps should we do like, you know, in the making the appointment and then the ensuring that you're not spending time with people that, you know, aren't, where should we put the, like the buyer's representation agreement? Uh, I would, uh, it's a great question and that the answer to that may change uh, legally within the next uh, six months with some things going on in the industry. The best place to do it would be in that 
uh, I want to say it's before the lender step. Okay. So you can, and you, you'll explain to them that this gives you the ability to, uh, to work with them and you're going to work with them pretty much exclusively. You're not going to, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time with them working to get them to find them their home. So that's, that is a great place to, to use it. Uh, if somebody's not willing to sign one of those agreements, to me today, that does not mean they're not a buyer. Okay, sometimes they just, they're not ready, they just met you, and so we can have them sign it before uh, they write the offer, okay? But uh, if you can get it signed early, that's, that's great. Uh, we are doing this, uh, this particular video is happening October 10th, uh, 2023. There is a, a few cases with the national, uh, a, a few, uh, price-fixing uh, federal cases uh, against the real estate National Association of Realtors that are going on right now. And uh, there's a group of buyers from the Midwest that are trying to get the rules changed to say that the sellers shouldn't be paying the buyer's agent's commissions. So it's a big industry fight right now, and we'll see how it all un uh, how it works out. And so my, the reason I gave that date, my counsel on that could change depending on the outcome of these lawsuits. So uh, that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, it's a great question. Anything else? That's all the questions I have. All right, well, thank you both for being here today and I hope this helps and uh, let's go work with your buyers. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right. Something, a hair or something has been tickling me. I'm trying not to touch it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I just can't wait. Okay, I want to tell somebody right now. I'm like, I don't always think, you know, you don't always feel like uh, I need to get a buyer's representation agreement. Mm -hmm. Because, like, if you, you, like the gut feeling thing. Yes. But on this person, I'm like, I'm not sure. Well, I went to show my property over the weekend. And then he got to talking. You're going to be like, well, duh, when I say this. But then he was like, oh, another agent showed me a property on the 16th. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. Um, if you'd like me to work with you, yes, I would love to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if not, I'm good. I don't waste my time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's and it's okay to say, well, is, uh, is there... Uh, do you have a preference? Would you rather work with that agent or would you rather work with me now that they've met, met with both of you? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being upfront about that. It's not confrontational. You don't need to feel it's confrontational. And uh, chances are they're going to like you better anyway. So it's just, uh, you know, so you explain to them that you want, uh, you know, if they're, you're going to spend a lot, of, you're willing to spend a lot of time working with them to find the right home and everything. So you want to make sure that they're committed to you as well. Mm -hmm. Did you ask so. them if they have a buyer rep signed with the other agent? He does not. Well, I had already shown him a couple, and then when I showed him one, the one this weekend, he said something about an Alabama, and I was like, well, I'm also licensed in Alabama, because it's the property he's looking yes. for in Alabama. So I was like, I'm also licensed in Alabama, and he was like, I don't know, it was just odd, because he was like, I think he's just, the one that the other agent showing him is a for sale by owner. Okay. And he said, he said, I... I'm thinking about just looking it up and just, he said, because that agent just wants to make money off of me. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, there's more to it. Yeah. People think it's I was easy, like, but it's not. And I was like, did that agent reach out to you did, to make money? <laughs> or did you call that agent? Right. Mm -hmm. Spend his time finding that property online for you. And I, did, yeah. I didn't say that right like that. I understand. I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's worth it to have that agent. I said, whether you work with that agent or you work with me, mm -hmm. I was like, girl, you'll have somebody to represent you and to negotiate on your behalf. Good. And, mm -hmm. but, so you get red flags and mm -hmm. just, just be careful and you'll know when to cut them loose or mm -hmm. make them stay yeah. with you. So that's yeah. what I've got to that's talk hard to him to today. So <laughs> there's a way, you know, from what I understand to present that where it's not so scary, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, this shows that we're going to be working together. Mm -hmm. 
and you know here's the details blah 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 yeah we're going so, to have uh, we're going to have a couple classes on that yeah. very thing on how you present that and yeah. and so forth so, yeah, so that'll it's be not coming so up scary right I think some people present it like ooh and then it scares the people right mm -hmm. or there was one time we were buying a house in Kentucky and um, I'd never met this one agent before and he pulled out this representation form. I was like, oh, I don't even know him. I don't even know if I like him. Right. You don't know yet. Right. No. And I more likely didn't really like him. I, mean, <laughs> I just, I don't know. There's no warm and fuzzies or nothing, you know? Yeah. And uh, I said, well, no, not not right now. Let me let me think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have thought about it. And think, okay, well, he wasn't that bad, you know. Yeah. But he kept on and... I never called him back. I was right. Like, nah, that was just too forceful. That comes back to the gut feeling. You know, we you're. We but we use somebody else. Yes. He you're going to. You're going to feel. If somebody feels that kind of pressure. It's not good. They're they're gonna, you know, like when we're kids, we play with magnets, and uh, there's times that magnets will come together, and times they'll repel each other yeah. if you turn it around. So I'm a uh, tough customer. So and think about that on yourself. Are you a tough customer? That's what I always think when I'm working with somebody. Mm -hmm. How would I feel? How might they feel? Yeah. I just try to do that. Mm -hmm. It's the golden rule. Still works. Yeah.